my brothers and sisters in Christ, it is so good to be back with you again, and here we go again. Uh, we're going to look at two areas starting off. Remember, we got to pick up and catch up with the book of Daniel, and we're going to look also at Psalms, okay, uh, prayer for deliverance in Psalm, because that's what Daniel is going through, and what he needs is a prayer that will be able to deliver him from a precarious situation. And when I say precarious, this is life and death. But before we look at Daniel's, just look, look with me in Psalms 88 for a little bit, and we're going to look at the prayer. Uh, remember, we're talking about love and prayer, which is, see, because love is, is the ultimate, love is the key. Forgiveness is the ultimate weapon. Prayer is the savior, the deliverer. You know what I mean? Psalms 88 and verse number one. O Lord God of my salvation, I have cried day and night before thee. Now, the crying day and night don't necessarily mean that he's dropping tears out of his eyes. You know, nobody can. Some people can cry, you know, like that and well Rachel did it when her children was not and uh, we see that the wailing women of God they're able to you know uh, Jesus when he was in the garden of Gethsemane he cried out to God with great uh, drops of sweat or blood that came from his body the, protru the protrusion of it was so powerful the strain of it was so powerful until it released blood inside of his sweat. And so this cry is an inward cry that each and every one of us, it is a prayer that God would deliver us, deliver me in life, deliver me from death. And he goes on to say in verse number two, let my prayer come before thee, incline thine ear unto me. How many of us, each and every one of us, even a child, wants or needs the attention of whatever it is that is ailing or wailing us. People do all kind of things in life for attention, but what he's saying is, Lord, hear me, because there's a need inside of me. So God knows how to answer your most heartfelt condition. Yea, the Spirit of the Lord searcheth all things, even, yea, even the deep things of God. So what God does, he goes inside the depths of your heart. And what happens is that your mouth don't speak. Your tongue do not speak. Your mouth in your tongue is inside of your heart. Do you hear me? So your heart uses your tongue to speak unto God the most heartfelt condition of your cry. And when he declares, let my prayer come before thee, incline thine ear. When he say incline thine ear, he's saying, Basically, let what I hear <laughs> be you and let what you hear be me. You see, give me your undivided attention, God. I need you. Remember the school teachers? Put your thinking caps on, children. We got to take a test. Okay. For my soul is full of troubles. Now, What's happening here? Anytime something is full, that means it can't hold anything else. So then it goes into overflow. So there's no more room for any more trouble or problems in his life. So he's saying, God, Father, empty my garbage. Empty my troubles. Take them, 
because this is where my soul is. In my life draw it nigh unto the grave. Something is to the place to where he's tormented even unto where despair of life, anguish, and then vexed to the point of death or the grave. Now, he's going to go on, and it's going to get a little rough and heavy up in there. For in verse number 4 in Psalms 88, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that hath no strength. This is when God is the most powerful in your life is when you can do absolutely nothing no more. Actually, you know, we're taught and we're saying, well, don't never give up. Don't never give up. No, you don't give up. Don't never give up on God. Of course not. Don't never give up on yourself. Of course not. But God is really looking for those three words. I. So you're going to personalize it now. I, out of myself, give, which means all my troubles to you. I cannot handle nothing no more. My situation, my problem, my issues, I give releasing unto you up. You see, that's when you give up to the Father so he can release down unto you. For all the promises in him are yea in a man. You know what gets God about you? Is that when you ask God for something, let's say for instance, okay, you got to take a test. All right? You got to go to school. And you, you, you pray, Lord, just God, just please let me pass this test. Lord, just, or you trying to get a job. Lord, just, God, just help me to get this job. And God say to you, it's done. You're going to pass the test. You're going to get the job. Be at peace. Then he's sitting peace all the way down there on you. <laughs> Instead of peace, you go and you fight hell in high water with stress, with worry. Oh, Lord, I don't know. And, and, and you, you, you don't even know why you're doing it. And you know what God is doing? God is sitting back, boy, laughing like, ha, ha, he, he, ho, ho, whoo, angels, heaven, come look. I done blessed him. See, what you don't see is that God already have hired you for the job. They already got your application there. You see, what you don't see is that you already got a 98 on the test. You already got an 88 on the test. How about that? Psalms 88. But you're sitting up worried, and then God is sitting back laughing and saying, Oh, ye of little faith. So the next thing you know, here you are stressed out. You go and take the test. You go and get the job. You, you pass and you get the job. You take the test. You pass the test for school or whatever. And you're like, Whoo, oh, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, like, get on down the road. Go find you something else to do. You see. So God is sitting up falling his head off laughing at you and I. After he has told us all this well. You're going to be okay. You're going to get through this. Trust in me. Don't lean to your own understanding. Oh faithless and perverse generation. Where is your faith? So he wants you to move. Instead of worrying, when he tells you it's done, you got the job. You're going to pass the test. Here's what you do. Oh, Lord, thank you. Oh, Lord, thank you. Father, I'm just going to study a little bit more. God said, go ahead on. Make better than what I've already done given you, if you keep it. God already know. He, and you're like, oh, Lord, I'm just going to relax. God like, yeah, just relax. Go, go sit down. Go, go watch a movie or something. Have some chips and some dips. You see. So, in the book of Daniel, in chapter 
number 6. We see in verse number 11, Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and make a su making supplication before his God. Why? Because they couldn't get him on nothing else. The same thing they do everywhere else when you are in a pay place to where you don't break the rules, to where you are obey obeying the laws and the commands. Anybody anywhere can set up a law to destroy you at any time because truth in today's time is void in the land. So Daniel's in a setup, all right, because they can't get him on nothing else. And you'll see in verse number five, then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel except we find it against what? Him concerning the law of his God. So we cannot get you. So they want to find something to extract from you religiously. That's why I tell you, don't you ever let nobody bring your God up in your face and some religion up in your face to convict you and to condemn you. A judge better not dare say to me. A lawyer better not dare say to me, you a Bible-believing Christian. The word of God says this or the word of God said that while they trying to kill you while using God's words. No, the hell with y'all. Get on up out of here. Don't you fall for that mess. And what's happening in today's time, the lie is now changed into a truth to where men, as I said in the book of uh, uh, Romans, would rather believe a lie than the truth. So God has given us over them, over to a reprobate mind, false. So the fakeology of theology in Christianity in the world system is now null and void. You can penetrate anything, say anything. People, let me tell you something. Pastors can lie. Preachers can lie. Governors, senators, children. Everybody can lie. Husband and wife can lie. The television can lie. A cartoon can, everything can lie. Disney Channel. Everything, everything, everybody, everywhere can tell any lie to anybody about anything. And that lie is a perception of a truth. Because you are living under the veil of a lie in today's time. And the only thing that's going to get you through it now is lies all in the church. They, boy, they... They don't want to mess with me today. Not just, and, oh, me. By the way, um, Arby and Mother Hines, Sister Hines, and Sister Auntie Hines, and um, all of you that was up at the um, home going of Miss Hattie uh, Pearl, I think it's Mathis, I believe. Uh, Arby's grandmother is Hattie. Hattie, Hattie, you know, I'm sure. Arby, you know, y'all know me. I want to say to the um, Living Strong viewers, Universal Truth also, you can catch me on Universal Truth on YouTube, okay? The home going was such a wonderful and great home going in a fellowship of reunion. And I thank God for the, you know, you know how it is when God completes something? And I got to say this, y'all, because this is very important. All of that rainstorm that we just recently had just this past weekend on Saturday and Sunday night, we had to go and send our mother home and have the home going during this time. I had spoke to Brother Hines that morning, and I said, uh, Brother Hines, I said, uh, I said, man, uh, y'all going to make this thing? You know, I called it about eight, eight you know, your time now. We're in daylight savings time. but And welcome back to my world. For those of you who have re-entered my world from your daylight savings time, I really don't want y'all over here. And I really don't want y'all on this time because this is the time that I stayed ahead of y'all. So now God and I, we worked something else out because this is my world, okay? 
making the long story short, and we never, never make it short. But uh, Brother Abby and I had done agreed and prayed, and I said, Brother Abby, God told me one thing. He said, push through the storm. No matter what it's like, no matter what the weather is like. He said, when it comes down to love, one, and home, going in celebration, he said, push through it. We got there, and, and the sun came out before the service was over. And let me tell you something. It went from a strange, hellacious storm to a beautiful, bright, and sunny day. Half of y'all remember that yourself. You saw? What is God saying? That if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed and you just obey and press and push through the storms of your life, you will and you shall come out on top. So I want to thank all of the people that I got a chance to meet, the hospitality, uh, you know, the love that they showed, brother and sister ministers, um, um, Tuan and Monica, and uh, prophetess uh, Constance, and you know, and I send my love to them, McLean, brother McLean, all of them. I send my love to all of them because the people. No genuine and real love when they see it. And what is God doing? He's shaking the barriers around them. Everything that came to bind them, to tie them up, to hold them back. God sent a word in and said, I'm going to shake it now. And just make it like the, uh, the, the, the balls or the bands or the steel balls in the band of a wheel. You know how they're in together on that rotary? And you got to put them in there and make sure you re-grease it and everything else and oil it down so it runs smooth. Well, the Lord did the same thing. But only this time I'm shaking the bands and I'm shaking the balls are loose. So that everything that came to tie them up, to hold them down, God said, I release them from it. You see? Because this is the best year and the best day that is yet to come. And I want to say to Brother Himes and Abby and the, the rest of the family that we're praying for y'all. The homegoing celebration was great. And God did such a wonderful thing. I'm just sorry and I apologize for not being able to get there and get that good food that y'all had. And I felt real terrible about that. And, um, you know, but nevertheless, the gesture was well-meaning. And um, I wasn't able to get to the to good food part. So, and y'all know I missed that. But let me show you this, since since I had a, had a fit there earlier, and I probably shouldn't have went through that. But um, y'all know how I am. And um, where was I at? Over in the book of Daniel. Oh yeah, in the book of Daniel. So we're praying for the. Brother Arby and his family, and all is well in Jesus' name. And I thank Living Strong viewers uh, for their love and their support. Remember that in the book of Daniel, chapter number 6 and verse number 5, these men uh, said they couldn't find none against Daniel except they find against his God. In verse number 11, these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication to his God. You see, what's happening here? They're trying to build a case against him. And that's what the enemy will do. And so you will look in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. You will see in verse number 16. But be it so, I did not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you with guile. You see what I mean? So you got to be able to watch out for Christian craftiness, utilizing guile. Christian craft, witchcraft, guile, or subtility as Satan beguiled the woman. You see, did I make a gain of you by any of them whom I sent unto you? Now, this is very powerful, and every pastor and preacher need to hear this. The apostle said, did I gain anything out of you when I sent Timothy and Titus, when I sent the the, the minister, the pastors, the prophets. When I sent an envoy to your church or a supplement, 
or a representative? Did I send them there to pimp y'all, to prostitute y'all, to make gain out of y'all? That's what you got to watch. Leaders everywhere have got to watch people sending other folks to their ministry only to gain and to profit from them. Remember, if you took 15, 20, 30 years to build that church and to get those people and you worked hard praying for them, uh, and I mean, you know what I mean, fasting, I mean fellowshipping, everything that you, 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 you taught them. And then you got some slickster, city slickster, and country bumpkin that come in with a pseudo-psychological, uh, mind-altering anointing to favor and to move and to motivate and to germinate as with no demonstration to bring out of them their substance, you see, their revenue, only to leave there laughing while the church and the pastor had got to wait a whole nother month to the people get their EBT card and food stamp to come up and give a decent offering again. You don't need that, okay? So in verse number 17, did I make gain of you by any of them whom I sent to beguile you? Uh, is Daniel making any gain? Is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego making any gain? Remember, my focus is Daniel in prayer and love. I desire Titus. And with him, I sent a brother. Did Titus make a gain of you? Did the person that I sent to represent me, did they make a gain of you? Did, did you bless them? Did you give to them? Did they come to pimp you, to play you? No, walk we not in the same spirit, which means the person that you sent out to represent you ought to have a same character, a same integrity. Walk under that anointing in that spirit of love, you see, to help your ministry. This is why you don't send out ill-fated represent representers, okay? The ones with me, they all represented themselves. They all did their own thing, no matter what I told them. The only thing that got most of them was the one thing that did none of them like. And I said, you're not going to be up here for one hour, hucking and shucking, popping and locking, heeing and hollering with no nothing. Take that junk on. I said, you got 30 to 45 minutes, and you can't crack that code by then, brother. Go sit down. And guess what? Half of them couldn't do it. None of them couldn't hardly do it, but all of them had to do it. And the ones that got mad, they didn't come back. Because y'all, white people, y'all know black people like to stay in church for three hours while y'all be out in 30 minutes. That's why white people go to lunch and, and dinner lunch at 11 and 12, black people go in three, two, three, and four. All right? That's just American style there. I started getting out and going to, lunch to, to eat with the white people on Sunday. I would get to church out by 12, 12.30 and split the time. And then watch the other black people driving up while we leaving the service to go eat with the white folks. Here it is, because the white people got the best part of the food. Black people got the leftovers. I know he didn't. Oh, yes, I did. But that's my sister here, okay? <laughs> because they rotate the food all day. <laughs> all right? <laughs> here it goes. But that's the way it was. In the, let's leave it. Let's just be quiet. Here it is. He said in verse number 19, again, think you that we excuse ourselves unto you? Now, you think I'm going to make an excuse or excuse myself unto you? Do you think that I'm going to let you kowtow me? In what you are saying about my God, about our ministry, and, and having an excuse, that's what's wrong with the church right now. Too many of the pastors make excuses to the, to the congregation. They apologize too much. We speak before God in Christ. 
we speak before God in Christ. Oh, I love that. No, no, not God and Christ. You know, church of God and Christ. No, 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 no. We speak for God in, inside of the word. The anointed one is his anointed. So the word is in us and we are in the word. So we are speaking for God through Christ the word. Here it comes. But we do all things, dearly beloved, for your edifying. The reason we are humbling ourselves and going through hell and high waters to get you blessed. Have you ever seen people that you go to work for and people that you help and people that you bless <coughs> and you do everything for them and they don't appreciate it? Hmm? Mm -hmm. I thought so. That's the way it is. Come on now, y'all. That's the way it is, church folks. For I fear lest when I come. Now, watch this. After all we done taught y'all in the church, come on, Daniel. I shall not find you such as I would. I, I'm afraid that when I come, come to church, y'all not going to be in y'all right mind. Y'all going to be crazy. The devil going to be done got back in you. You're not gonna, I'm not going to find you like I left you. Because when I showed up, you were anointed, speaking in tongues, hollering, shouting, dancing, spitting, casting out demons, and everything else, and floating through walls. But now look at this right here. I'm going to leave the church. Now, y'all, look at what happened when the pastor leave. I done seen this happen. I did it a many times. Had to leave somebody else in charge, okay? And, and the, you know, and the person I left in charge wasn't supposed to be the closest one to me. But this is what happened. After I left, everybody was fine. But when I came back, all hell done broke loose. You know, the pastor or the person in charge uh, that they leave opened the door and, and have a demonic even party coming in. They open the door for devils to come in. Here it is. For I fear lest when I come, I shall find you as such as I would, and that I shall, uh, and that I shall be found unto you such as you would not. <laughs> you know? Now, this is all confusing, but it's not. He, he's basically saying, I shall be found unto you such as you would not. In other words, you're going to turn out to be something that I know that you're not supposed to be again, lest there be debates. What is I'm finding in you that you are not? I didn't leave this in you. Debate. You see, you got to have some minister fighting some other body else. The piranha syndrome, where everybody's in a cesspool. Everybody done growed up. They done got fat. The church don't have no rotation. The church don't have no coordination. All this got is a who's who contest. Everybody want to be seen on the program. Everybody want to get up and say something before the pastor. Everybody want to get up and say something after the pastor. And everybody want to dispute somebody else that done said something about what they done said. And then you got people throwing off. Debates. Envy. Now you're jealous. I don't have no time for that. Envy. That, that's in the church. <laughs> of somebody else's anointing. Somebody else's word. Now you are envy of somebody else. Wrath. Now you're mad mad as hell because things are not going your way. Strife. You're going to get other people up in there to, to, to drive a wedge in. You're keeping up hell and high water, whispering behind the back, backbiting. Now you're backstabbing everybody else and, and they backstabbing you. This is what's going on because you're in the piranha syndrome. You are locked down in the dungeons, in the pits of the hellacious a uh, uh, church atmosphere called four walls and y'all meet there every service y'all meet there every Sunday and when you meet you got to dress up you got to make up you got to show up and then on top of that you got to put up and you got to shut up whispering go home on the hell of a phone talking in the church bathroom Talking in the church parking lot. Pastors, when you see people don't leave the church and you don't left, they're out there talking about members, talking about each other. Oh, yeah, getting a little click together, getting a little piranha fish food syndrome worked out, swellings and tumults, which means they pump us, swole all up. I'm bigger than you. I'm better. My head is big. Tall much, which means mud, muds of rolling waves. They keep
keep sitting in unless when I come again, my God will humble me among you and that I shall be well men uh, which have sinned already uh, and had not repented uh, of the uncleanliness, uh, of the fornication, uh, of the lasciviousness uh, which they have committed. Uh, and God is saying, uh, why can't you straighten that out? Uh, why can't you get that together? Uh, and the reason why uh, is because you're too busy killing each other. <laughs> Church folks. Hmm. And then in verse number 12, Daniel, then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's degree. So now that they made a law to get rid of Daniel. And I don't have no time for this. <coughs> I really don't want to talk about it. Because um this, this brings me back to no man being above the law in, 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 in this nation and in other nations of the world. I've told y'all a million times, living strong viewers, please listen to me. You're going to hear me say this repeatedly, over and over again. Satan have fed you through the media, through your commentators, through your reporters, through your suggestors on television. That no man is above the law. That is a lie that came straight from the pits of hell in from a satanic order to subliminally brainwash you into believing that that statement is true. That statement is not true. And you know this when it comes to your court hierarchy supreme, your government officials, your lawyers, your judges, certain city councilmen, people who run small towns and cities, they all are above the law because they are the law. The law is not made or them. They only are not above the law if they are caught red handed as the man that killed George Floyd. And there is no other choice in that the law cannot conceal its lie from them. Then the law has no other choice but to act. The law is for the average peasant, normal people in America that try to live an everyday life, the poor, the law is not for the rich, as you would suppose. Remember that now, and y'all going to hear me tell y'all this over and over again. Remember a lie reigns supreme in America. A lie is the law. <laughs> Woo! Minister Boy, you better keep me tight on that time. I'm ready to finish. We got to get this tomorrow night because we're not gonna finish this tonight. Then came they near. I'm gonna finish up right here. We'll get started on this tomorrow. We'll go back in Daniel. We'll look in Psalms again. Then came they near and spake before the king concerning the king's degree. See, the king's word is the law. The law is the law. So the king's word is law. So his decree is law. That's why they write into certain laws. The law is good. Now get this. When it governs righteously. The law is good. People, please hear me. I'm not against no law. I'm not against no judges, no police, and none of I'm See, I'm just a truth teller. I'm not against it. I know what it does. Do you hear me? The law is good when it is right, when it serves right, when it does right. That's why God's law 
is the best in the law that we will all have to answer to. You see, I love the law when they do their job. You see, don't make me mad. When they serve their sports, when they serve their conferences, when they serve their presidents, they line up in their black cars and their vehicles and they go and they check and they do this and do that. They are protecting and serving events. But when it's all over and you go back to your small rural town and you go across your railroad track, you got your local hound hunters out there in the street hunting people. Do you see this human? I'm closing, minister. I know I'm over right now, but I'm closing. Then they came inspect before the king concerning the king's decree hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within 30 days save of thee O king shall be cast into the den of lions the king answered and said this thing is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians which alter it not. You see it? They will set you up according to their law to destroy you. Fast is 30 minutes in broadcast. First time back. That's my time. I'd like to thank you for yours. Remember, keep Arby, Hines, and family in prayer on this week as we continue to thank God for the celebration of the home going of Mother Hattie Mae. And we, that's going to be my time. I'd like to thank you for yours. No more time. I'll see you guys tomorrow night. Love you too. Bye.